On the fourth panel, which is entitled Data as a Driver of Social Innovation, we have Lillian Corral, who's the Chief Data Officer for the Office of Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. We have Michael McAfee, who's the President of Policy Link, and Clarence Wardell, the Director of Repurposing for Results and the former Director of the White House Police Data Initiative. Um, and I have the good fortune to moderate this panel as well. So while I'm talking, we're going to have our, our tech folks help help put on microphones for the new group, and then they're going to join. But what I thought I might do is to talk a little bit about data um, once again and thinking about what needs potentially needs to happen in the health field to help drive social innovation. Um, what about local health data? It, Bill, Bill Vega put up a slide that had things split up into 15 areas. You notice they were quite strange in terms of how the geography was measured, if you would have called number eight South LA, the people who know South LA would kind of, that's not really what I envision as South LA. And so one of the conversations that's come out in the health field is, is that we might need better local health data. Um, what we do know to be the case is that most health data are available at very large geographic scales. You might have county, you might have some sub-county aggregates. Our own LA Public Health Department does things in terms of the spas, uh, as, as some of you know. You might even get some health data in terms of zip codes. Um, many practitioners argue that we need to do better than that. If we're going to allow communities to advocate on their behalf and to note where the outcomes currently are, then we need to have data that drops to the community level. But there's a fear in this space that perhaps is a bigger fear than, than in other spaces, is that we have to protect the confidentiality of those who are living in particular places. So with that context, what do you do? Well, one option is to just look at the pyramid that both uh, John Moon used the pyramid, Bill Vega had a different, different shape there for us, that said, well, social determinants of health is 40%. You know, if you move up the pyramid, then you have built environment that might be another 20%, but it takes money to get to the nicer built environment, so maybe it is all that. And maybe all we have to do is just focus on social determinants, and maybe we don't need to actually have local health data. So that's one way to go, is to focus on that. Um, another way to go is to try to use local data that it, it proxies either geography or, some, or, or something else, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the childhood obesity data, not perfect, but that's available through our schools here in, in California. Or we might actually, at this point, use statistical models to try to attribute population level health data to local areas. So those are some options in front of us. Um, tell you a little bit about the school data that's available for those of you working in communities. There's something called fitness gram that students who are in the fifth, seventh, and ninth grade take. Um, it's actually quite good data on childhood obesity that is collected. It doesn't actually come out exactly in that form, but it's still a very useful form nonetheless. What it tells us is whether someone is of a very high health risk, whether they need improvement, whether they're in the healthy fitness zone, or whether they're very lean. So it gives us these broad scales, not quite the BMI measures that we're used to, although those data are collected. When you take those kind of data, we might be able to do a little bit better than our, our SPAs, our health data that we get from our uh, public health agencies. Uh, and, and so, I, as I say here, you have to have some choices about how you attribute these data because they're school level. Um, two choices one could imagine are to actually just look at the neighborhood the school's in and say that's the characteristics of that population in that place. Or you could do some kind of algorithm to smooth these data across space. For the map that I'm going to show you here, what we did is just to say if the school is located in that place, then we're going to attribute the population characteristics to that place. And so you're going to see some holes here. And the holes are there because there isn't a school in that particular census tract or census block. Yet it still tells us something about where students are in the healthy fitness zone or not in the healthy fitness zone. 
And so you might be able to do some community planning around that. And if you go to some of the, the neighborhoods that I've highlighted in a couple of previous slides, you see some things that pop out you know, somewhat dramatically and that in place like Watts, there is a very small percentage of, of children that are in the healthy fitness zone. In Florence and Koreatown, there's some mix, um, and Koreatown has some places with pretty high percentages, neighboring places with pretty low percentages. These are schools that are adjacent to each other that, that have this disparity here. And then again, the holes are places where there aren't schools located in that particular census tract. So this is data that gives us better, something better than we maybe had before, but it might feel still incomplete. So the other approach that that's, that um, is out there is, is this really ambitious project by the CDC funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called the 500 Cities Project. And given the need to know much more about the broad set of health conditions that it might operate at the local level, this project, and these are the quotes from the website, I'm not going to read them here, really is trying to provide small area estimates of what you might expect in a particular geography. What's interesting, of course, about this is that it's only going to be as good as the model that you're going to use. However, it again enables us to kind of see through a lens of a lot of different kinds of health conditions. There's actually 27 available that we can, they can look at. And you can go to the website and, and basically do this kind of analysis, create these maps yourself. You might be interested in asthma prevalence by census tract, right? And there we can see certain neighborhoods are popping out and in fact, that actually maps in some of the corridors exactly where we saw high poverty. Others, you're perhaps not shockingly, if you live near the port and near that transportation corridor, you're going to have a lot higher asthma prevalence. And you can see up these transportation corridors as well. You know, you go to the neighborhoods that we've been looking at, you see the highest asthma prevalence in Watts and, and Florence. We can look at cancer prevalence. Um, now, this is one that in some ways, I thought this map begged more questions than gave answers. You actually see highest cancer prevalences in some of our higher income areas, um, but again, they're sprinkled around. So this might suggest that people are actually getting treatment for cancer in some of these places and maybe not in other places where they not have the same access to care. Um, you could have also overlaid this with a map of where are the federally qualified healthcare facilities. Again, these are just provocative to in today's conversation. And if we drop down to, to cancer prevalence in the three communities, actually these communities, in terms of who is being diagnosed with cancer, turn out to, to look quite good on this measure. Um, the final one that I wanted to show, because it came up in the conversation, is what about mental and or behavioral health? And here you, you see in some of our communities, again, then Watts and Florence, that there's really high incidence of people reporting that their mental health is not good in the last 14 days. So these are just kind of maps that might help guide the action that needs to be taken on the ground. Um, just concluding thoughts on this, you know, if advocates for community health are, are certainly at a distinct advantage with respect to data. But the question that this next, you know, you know, panel is going to look at is kind of around what can data do to empower communities and what can data do to help drive social innovation. You know, if we rely on proxies, either social determinants or the built environment and so forth, we might notice some of these other factors that appear to be coincide with these, these rates of lower health, whether it's the fact that South LA residents only have 60 full uh, service grocery stores within the range that I defined in that geography, but most food outlets are inconvenience or corner stores. Um, where I really want us to get to in this conversation is to answer this question, what data are needed to provide a generative environment to spur social innovation and to drive community empowerment? And with that, I'm going to change hats. I'm going to change to a wireless mic. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to um, ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about how their um, own work, how they see data affecting the practice in your work, so you can define your work, certainly. Um, and in Clarence's case, I, I had met him when he was working with the White House Police Data Initiative, so I've asked him to also speak on that in, in, in addition to his current work. Um, and then in their context, define what you mean by data. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lillian Corral. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the City of Los Angeles. Um, first, I'll start by asking how many of you even knew there was a Chief Data Officer in the City of Los Angeles? Oh, good. <laughs> That's a much better answer than I thought. Um, so, um, 
than I expected. Usually people don't even know. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a more common role and it's a very exciting time to be actually be working in data, especially in government. So I actually want to start by um, saying that 25 years ago, um, I, um, I was a, an undocumented teenager in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley partly because my immigrant single mother um, had learned that the schools were better out there. Um, but nonetheless, I do remember the day of uh, the verdict, and I actually remember seeing the sky in particular and all of the fire, um, even all the way out there, um, and just understanding my own context and the fact that there was a lot of otherism, even in the immigrant community, about who we were and <coughs> whether or not we actually belonged in California, and really feeling um, a sense of place and time and a bond with what was going on in a very sort of what felt like removed um, area for me at the time. Um, and that sort of eventually led me to art and politics and um, I got to the chief data officer role um, through, a you know, through a series of stints in the labor movement and in the nonprofit sector and working on community organizing. So I try to think that a lot of the work that I do is still grounded in that social justice movement, even though it's very data and tech driven um, nowadays. Um, so one of the things um, I wanted to sort of talk about or I, I wanted to make sure was um, uh, shared with you all today is the, the city's own efforts around open data. It wasn't happening 25 years ago, and it's something that actually has tech, that technology has enabled, which is that it's really allowed government, especially you know political leaders who want to engage in transparency, um, open up the city's data and information in ways that allow you to do a lot of what Gary has shown today, right? But, you know, you know, historically, the government has shared information in bite sizes, in PDFs, in, um, in aggregate forms that they um, control, that we control. Um, and now, as data is becoming more prevalent, and we put all that raw data out there, we're actually seeing that the community can actually get engaged and do that work themselves and be able to contextualize and talk a lot more about the work that's happening. So one of the things that we do in the city of Los Angeles um, and the work that I do is oversee the city's pretty large open data program, which publishes over a thousand data sets. And when Gary asked what kind of data is useful or what kind of data we should be using, um, I like to argue that we should be using all kinds of data. I think throughout the day, um, we've seen what the panelists have said about not just place, but also um, really thinking about health, whether it be in the built environment, um, or thinking about crime from different angles. And so what we like to do in our work is focus on looking at anyone social issue um, that we're, ta we're trying to focus on with, from multiple angles. Um, we want to focus on creating a data experience where you can commingle any kind of data set, whether it be every single street poll in the city, which we actually have available, and mix that with crime. Every single, every single crime point over the last six years is now available in the city's open data portal. And then you can actually mix that with um, sense of safety or perhaps even walking, walkability patterns in the city. And that, we feel, is actually what can drive social innovation when we commingle and collaborate around different data points to try and look at an issue. Um, the big component, one of the big components of open data is really trying to do civic engagement um, and, um, and engage not just your traditional researchers and journalists who use a lot of government data um, to, for accountability purposes, um, but really trying to engage with community. And so one of the things that you'll be seeing more of, at least from the, from the data side um, in, in, in the city's work, is actually allowing citizens to create citizens' accounts. <coughs> um, we're going to be rolling out a program where we actually work with nonprofits so that we can use our data and our platforms as a way for you to start to collect analyze and develop your own applications of what that data can look like in your community and what we're hoping as that more of that data is is shared publicly not just ours but the ones that communities um, and nonprofit organizations are collecting that it sort of begins to 
create that iterative um, innovation factor where there's no one person that can come up with the solution to anything or the iPhone just wasn't invented overnight, right? It required a lot of iteration and one of the things that we really strongly believe in is that social change requires a lot of iteration and so as much as we continue to put analysis out there and then share it so that somebody else can take that analysis and put their own perspective on top of it and then share that, that the more that we continue to build upon all of these iterations, that's where social innovation actually can happen. Good afternoon, happy to be here. Um, as Gary mentioned, uh, we met probably about a year-ish or so ago uh, in a different capacity. At that point, I was working with the Obama administration uh, on a few initiatives, one I'll speak about uh, shortly. Uh, into January, left the administration, took about two months off, uh, and have now been in a new role with an organization called Results for America um, as a director of uh, what we're calling Repurpose for Results, specifically some more supporting uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy's What Works Cities initiative. And so uh, part of that is uh, a goal of working with 100 mid sized cities across the country, so capacities be, or populations between 100,000 and a million to help build their capacity to use data and evidence for decision-making, community engagement, um, and then how do you drive the use of evidence-based policy and programs through, the, through that lens at the local level. And so we've seen uh, a lot of great work happen in places like New York, Chicago, LA, uh, DC, but what does it look like once you start to try to translate that work and do it at um, places with smaller populations, less resources, et cetera. And so, um, it's a little bit of work that I'm involved in now, so very excited uh, to be working on that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of a specific data set or, or set of data um, uh, that we were working on at the White House uh, around police citizen interactions. And so, um, this data set in particular, my, my time working with the administration started as a Presidential Innovation Fellow uh, in August 2014, um, actually September 2014, um, and I'm, I'm referencing August because that was about a month to the day after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. And so that whole fall, as folks remember, um, this notion of, of, of police-citizen relationships, particularly the relationship between police and minority communities, had kind of reared its head again in probably the biggest way since 92, right? Um, and so. One of the, the issues that, that quickly uh, found itself front and center on the president's plate was how do we get our arms around this and what can be done uh, at the federal level and particularly from the White House was the country's eyes were looking at the president to do something, but knowing that the levers of, of power, particularly around the law enforcement, the highly federated law enforcement system, uh, are pretty muted, right? And so you really need a lot of, 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 of actors in the space, particularly you need Congress moving to make some of the changes that people are quite frankly asking for. Uh, but early on, the president convened this task force on 21st century policing, um, a, a task force of law enforcement uh, uh, practitioners, academics, community organizers, activists. They did a listening tour across the country to look at and try to figure out what are some of the ways that we can start to move forward as a nation um, and as local police departments and cities to start to rebuild some of that trust in the relationships that had deteriorated over, over decades, quite frankly. Um, and so that, that, that task force came back with a slate of 59 recommendations. 14 of those recommendations dealt specifically with this notion of using data and technology uh, to improve police uh, community relations, to build accountability, and to engage. Um, and it's also worth noting that, um, so we remember at this time that, that a lot of the conversation nationally, one of the main issues that activists were raising actually had to do with this issue of data, right? And I'm sure folks in this room are familiar with the conversation that happened around the lack of officer-involved shooting data at the national level. And it was actually quite interesting that uh, many of the activists got an audience with the president in the Oval Office and this issue of data came up. And um, I wasn't in that meeting, but from the readout, a lot of uh, what I heard was this was one of the real issues that resonated with the president. He was quite frankly surprised, I think, like a lot of us, that we just didn't have this data set available at a national level, right? Um, and so some of the work that we started to do was we couldn't, you know, the, the White House does not have the power by fiat to say, every police department around the country, give us your data, right? Um, and so, but what we could do was at a high level, one of the advantages that we have there is we could start to look around the country and see departments who were already doing this work and basically try to galvanize a community of practice, bring those folks into conversation with not only one another, but in many cases with the local tech or data capacity in those communities. And so um, you'll see here, we, we started to look around the country and we saw many, several departments starting to do some of this work on their own. So there was Dallas Police Department in December of 2014, 
uh, Chief David Brown had released 12 years of officer of off shooting data at a very detailed level. Um, we had uh, Seattle Police Department was trying to get their arms around uh, body cam data and this notion of transparency and reda um, redaction of, uh, of video. So they held a, uh, a hackathon uh, with the local community there. And so we started to see uh, uh, many, uh, a few departments around the country doing some of this work. And so we, we invited those departments um, and some that we had had early conversations with to the White House along with uh, technologists, researchers. Um, and you'll see uh, we wanted to see if we could shift the paradigm from pre-August 2014, um, if you were to go into a police department around the country and say, give us your data, not only give us your data, make it publicly available, disaggregated in a machine-readable format, you'd have been laughed out the room, right? Um, and at the very least, the only type of data that was even available within that realm is crime data, and even that is not, is not very good and, 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 and not very ubiquitous, right? Um, so we wanted to see, could we get a coalition of the willing together to start to make pledges and to do this work and to be more open and transparent? So we had about 16 agencies there. You'll see on the side, you can, if you can make that out, we actually had LA County Sheriff's Department and LAPD both at the table that day, um, in part because they had such strong data capacity here at the local level. And so coming out of that, we had commitments from 16 law enforcement agencies and cities. We were able to eventually get up to 22 by the time the president announced this in May 2015 um, to essentially commit to um, releasing at least three data sets around police-citizen interactions. And so what we wanted, we were interested, yes, in the officer-involved shooting data, but the, the thing I think many of you know and what came out of the DOJ's Ferguson report and, and really, you know, if you even go back to 92 in L.A., it wasn't just that one particular incident. That incident was the spark for things that have been building up a long time, right? And so a lot of that was what does day-to-day -day interactions between police and citizens look like? Traffic stops, um, traffic and pedestrian stops, um, uh, what else am I forgetting? Um, community engagement, so times when uh, officers are in the, in the community, uh, use of force incidents, complaints against officers. So all of these other data sets that start to speak to that relationship that aren't just about officer-involved shootings. And so we asked departments to basically pledge be a part of a community of practice and commit to opening up these data sets. And so from that point, we had 22 that launched with this. Um, they made these pledges publicly. We, uh, we helped kind of convene this community of practice, did phone calls weekly to check in. Um, they were able to share out across themselves on the challenges they were having and really tried to help seed this community. It eventually grew, uh, by the time I left the White House, to 134 law enforcement agencies sharing, who had released, at that point, over 200 data sets. Um, and I would encourage folks, they actually, uh, so the Police Foundation, we had transitioned some of this work to the Police Foundation. They've just relaunched their site actually today. Uh, you can go see that at policedatainitiative.org uh, or follow their Twitter account at, uh, I think it's Police Open Data, uh, at Police Open Data. But so what we were doing, what were we trying to do across this? So one, just get the data out there, right? That was first and foremost, and help the departments build the capacity to do that. So a lot of times folks would say, look at the department and say, oh, they're just trying to be, um, they're just trying to be opaque. They don't want to share any of this data. But what we realized is that may be true in some cases, but a lot of these departments actually wanted to do it and just had no idea how to do it. So one of these pieces was how do we build that technical capacity and get them the resources to do it. And the other piece, though, in, in, our, in our push for this was the data is, is only a small piece of the issues between police and, and, and communities. But what if we could use data not just as a lens for analysis, but as a lens to drive dialogue and build uh, interactions at the local level? And so this was one of the events that we helped uh, pilot early on that, that we were actually just quite proud of. If, if folks know anything, New Orleans Police Department uh, is probably one of the, uh, historically been one of the most notorious police departments in the country. It's coming out of consent decree. Uh, they were one of the first to sign up. And so here you see they actually were, they, their, their chief information officer, their police chief had pledged to release this data. And so what they did before they actually released it to the public, they had a data preview event with the Operation Spark group here um, that was young students from the Lower Ninth Ward who were learning how to code and what they were doing and learning how to do this data analysis, not on just these arbitrary data sets, but on data about their community with the police chief there to answer questions with some of his patrol officers there and with the city CIO, right? And so the great thing, we didn't, we didn't get any apps out of that. We didn't get any deep analysis out of that day. But what we got was the beginning of this dialogue and this conversation, really for us a model for how some of this work could happen. So we started to see similar events in Orlando, Florida, uh, Indianapolis, Louisville, Baltimore recently did one. Um, and so just to start to prime kind of this, this innovation piece and really as data is a driver for social innovation in a lot of, a lot of ways. And, and, and then the, the piece I started out with and what I'll leave with is uh, what we really wanted to do was start to build a community of practice and a coalition such that we could start to shift this paradigm where we get police departments and chiefs that when, when, when they hear data come up 
and they hear this open data come up, they know what that means. They, they believe to their core now that, they are, that it is part and parcel of being a good police force. And so that's, that's the long-term objective that we have. Um, we're starting to see some of that. It's still a long way to go, uh, but we're, we're excited about the momentum that we were able to, to generate there. Uh, I know we're living in kind of a different world than we thought we might be living in right now, but I think because that work is happening at the local level, it wasn't, it wasn't pledges that, the, that these communities made to the White House, it was pledges they made to their own constituents and the people they were serving, and so I think we'll continue to see a lot of that work moving forward. So. What I wanted to do was to share a couple of kind of a couple of points that of what we're learning about how data needs to be married to drive community change. There's a couple things that we're learning. The first is that data can't be decoupled from the leadership function. Data can't be coupled, decoupled from the leadership function. Too often people are having a conversation about data and they get intoxicated by it. But they actually have no intention of doing the work. <laughs> and so one of the things that we've learned in trying to secure promised neighborhoods is that if we're going to be successful, this is the system that we use to kind of move from just having a conversation about data to helping to design a federal program under the Obama administration to pumping a, a billion, more than a billion dollars into communities to build cradle to career systems. One of the first things that we learned is that if data without an abs data absent of having a disciplined approach to move from talk to action means you'll probably keep repeating the mistakes of the past. So for us, one of the first things we had to learn was, if we're talking about large scale community change, what have we learned from all the mistakes and successes of the past, and what do we need to do different? I often use the analogies, uh, analogy of being a coach. Imagine a coach that can't articulate the offense and defense they want the players to participate in. They struggle. Well, in many cases, data is the same way. We look at it and we say, oh, it's awful. And then we just call 100 folks in the room to start meeting, and they actually have no connection to a result, no connection to a measure of progress. So people instantly get frustrated and start trying to move away from the table. So this is why, for me, data has to be connected to the leadership function. But in addition to being connected to the leadership function, leaders have to have a consciousness about equity and what does that mean to live it out. So let me explain what I mean by that quickly. We think data should be used to help us form sense making around what is it that, what journey do we want to be on to achieve a certain level of results? And for us, what this is about is setting a container so it's absolutely tight so that we can do the fundamental task of leadership, which is to align contributions. We believe if you can't articulate these first couple of things and really have buy-in, you really aren't ready to do work, which is, can we declare the population we want to be in service of? It's great to look at data, but can we actually get clear about the population we're going to own and be in service to? Can we call out a couple of results that we want to see in a place? Can we actually declare a couple of measures of progress? Set the baseline for those measures of progress. Weave in what the evidence tells us will work, as well as our professional judgment. And this is often an important step that folks skip over, because it's easier just to move down to the programmatic work and not do that. And when we see that happens, we always see people come back two or three years later and have to clean up the bad practice. So what I want you to think about is the job of leaders is to set this container so that we can bring people into a room, make collective sense and commitment of the journey we want to be on, and then begin to get people to align their contributions to craft the right mix of solutions. And for Policy link, the right mix of solutions, includes families, programs, policies, and systems. Data isn't about community engagement. For us, contribution is. We should start with communities owning a contribution just as much as a policy organization would, a nonprofit would, a community group, or anyone else. And so to us, for us, if you really want to see community engagement, you'll see family members owning <coughs> their own contribution to an indicator. If it's third grade reading, you shouldn't see more nonprofits in the room talking about third grade reading than you see parents. As an example, <laughs> this was the case in Promise Neighborhoods. We had a whole group of nonprofits in rooms all across the country talking about third grade reading. You asked where the parents were, they actually didn't even own a contribution. They would come to community meetings and sit there and be reported out to about their kids. Think about how crazy that is. These are their kids. 
A simple little technique of starting to give parents a calendar where they could put a sticker on and read to their kids and just put a little note in the column to start talking about what struggles did their kid have or what was things that really caught their child's attention in a particular book was a way for parents to be accountable in a fun way, come to a community meeting, and then begin to report out, report out on their contribution. They were no longer passive participants in their community transformation. They actually were owners of it. And so that's why this is so important. And the last thing I will say here is this, that the innovation comes from struggling and failing to move from the baseline. The innovation comes from learning, struggling, to move from the baseline, to get that trend line on one of those indicators going in the right direction. If it's third grade reading, we're going to fail some years. Some years we're going to have progress, some years we're not. But are we learning how to get better at it? That's where the innovation comes. When you set this container and people are coming in the room to tell you what they're struggling with because they're trying to make progress hitting their targets and they're unable to do so, that's a radically different conversation than having data experts come up and tell you about your work. So the work of contribution is the work of ownership. It's the work of equity. It is the work of getting us to hold the interest of a population in mind and everyone in the room getting locked and loaded on from wherever they sit, figuring out what their contribution is, and then holding themselves accountable for making progress. And when it's not working, having the fundamental skill of being able to learn, to adjust, and to craft emergent strategy to get better. Sit. So all the, all the panelists actually did a great job at um, addressing both how data interacts with community engagement and also can act as a driver of social innovation. There's a, so I'm not going to follow up right now on that. We might return to that. Um, there's a couple things that did come up in, in my thoughts that are, that are relevant. One of them is that sometimes data has been looked at um, in the sense that data can be used for good and also for evil. Um, we, we know one of my colleagues at USC, Anna Owens, has done some work to show that as school quality data went out, performance data, right, test scores went out, that it actually increased segregation in communities because those who had the uh, incomes to act on that did so. And those who didn't have the incomes to act on moving to places that had higher test scores did not. Um, how do you, in, in your work and you thinking about your work, address the fact that data sometimes can be used in ways that actually increase inequality as opposed to provide more equity? How do you balance that? And anyone can jump in and, and try to take that first. Well, I, I think you talk about it. Uh, that's, that's one of them. Um, you know, so in the, the, the policing space, for instance, um, a lot of the conversation now uh, tends to people immediately want to jump to this notion of uh, you know talking about predictive policing, right? Mm -hmm. and what does that look like, and can we use this data for, for that? Um, and I think one one of the things that we always you know come back to is a that the data data is not neutral. It's, it's collected by someone, it's analyzed by someone, and so it can be used or collected in many different ways. I, I think there's a particular caution uh, when I talk to folks about the policing data, um, because quite frankly, a lot of the stuff the departments are releasing now just isn't that good. You know, this is the first time that many departments have even looked, thought to look at these data sets, let alone share them with the public. But you know, the, the, the traditional kind of argument around the open data process is that it's through that process of sharing it with the public, getting the feedback, making sure uh, that, it's, that it's appropriate to share with the public that you start to collect better data. Um, the thing that really scares me about a lot of the predictive policing stuff is because this, this data, these algorithms are being trained on data um, that was collected uh, in, a, in a quite frankly biased manner. Right, you know the, you know crime. Crime is crime is everything. I don't know if folks saw this. Uh, it was about a day or two ago. Uh, it's a really cool uh, um, uh, tool this guy built. He did a predictive, a, a white collar crime uh, predictive algorithm. Right, and so it was kind of flipped this notion on his head of where, mm -hmm. where we start to think about where does crime exist. Right, and like we probably make the argument crime exists everywhere. But what the data represents is where a particular police department at a moment in time decided that their policy, whatever that was at a point in time, decided that they would police, right? And so now we want to take that data that was collected and push it through to these systems. And I think uh, for us, we, we, we talk a lot to police departments around about this. Um, so part of it is just building that capacity for folks to, to understand what's happening with the data, to, to be critical of it, um, and then not just uh, blindly kind of follow where the tech vendors and what have you uh, are pushing it. But I think it's, it's conversation around this and, and kind of critical thinking and thought. 
certainly. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things on on data for for bad, I guess. Um, so our open data program is actually governed through executive directive, and so I think it actually. So the point about leadership in government around data, I think, is is, is very critical. In other cities, we don't. In other cities, these programs actually emerge from the bottom up. Um, and I actually think that we've been able to do in Los Angeles a really good job of both our mayor talking the data game and not just the, the, data, the data talk, if you will, data game, and not just um, it, legislating it, but actually acting upon the data <coughs> and really trying to set metrics for the city um, that then can be um, looked upon um, through our open data program and other efforts um, throughout throughout the entire administration. So that's that's a little bit different than in other cities. But I think the, the key part of making sure that the data is used for good is to remember that data is really a reflection of the business process, if you will, by which it was collected. And so it's really, um, so sometimes, you know, um, folks will look at the data set and find things that are missing or say it was collected in a certain way and, and then kind of just um, ignore the fact that there was something happening when all of those data points were collected. And I think when you actually can look at data from that standpoint, you actually start to understand some of the context for the collection. And then what's critical, I think, to making sure that it's applied properly is the civic engagement piece. One of the, the, one of the first key components of our open data executive directive is that it's really about um, putting the data out there so that it can empower Angelinos to hold the city accountable, to get involved in addressing social challenges, um, and, and using that data themselves. And I think that piece is what can help us create more context for how the data can be applied and how the measures that our mayor or leadership is actually putting out there to, to govern the city are truly reflective of the kinds of measures the community wants to be, uh, wants to see in place. And so the civic component, I think, is really huge, especially when it comes to government open data, to making sure that the information that we put out there is not used in a way um, that creates greater harm than good. Excellent. Michael, did you want to comment only thing, on The only thing issue? I will add is that data needs to be connected to a narrative that is really owned by the community. In many cases, data gets put out there and people know just enough about it to be dangerous. But it's out of context, and I'll give you some good examples. For example, in the Promise Neighborhoods work, when you talk about community change and in third grade reading, you know, program officers all the time would say, I expect to see change tomorrow. But the reality is they never talk to a teacher about what's a reasonable rate of change. If you're dealing with kids that are already two or three years behind, what should you expect to be progress? That type of context is critical <laughs> to know whether you're making progress or not. But that is rarely out there. And it's rare that we're given, for example, nonprofits and community members to express that point of view about whether progress is being made or not. And so what we needed to do at PolicyLink was to actually partner with Mathematica Policy Research and really do some phenom phenomenological work to start answering some of these questions like, how long does it take to make change? What's the context? as a way to provide air cover to folks doing the work on the ground. So it's just something to think about, that if you're going to just put the data out there, we also have to help people understand how to make sense of it in a way that is productive. Because expecting just a trend line to just go up forever is inaccurate. Expecting 30 to 40% leaps usually means folks are lying. <laughs> and so it's, that's what I mean when I say context. So the best way to help make sure this data is used right is for community to own the narrative and for us to help shape it with them. Well, Clarence, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges to bring these police data to light. Um, I, I think maybe I'd ask, ask the panel to think about broadly, what are the set of challenges to both bring data to community um, that operate maybe technological challenges, maybe it's cost challenges for some of the smaller cities that you're working with, Clarence. Um, what about also the political realities that we face? Meg brought up the political realities in her work uh, this morning. So I wondered if, uh, if all of you could comment on both the politics, the technology, the cost, those issues to, to take these next steps. Um, I'll, I'll just talk briefly. I think the, the, the politics is a, is, a, is a really big one uh, that, that you hit on. Um, you know, for many, many of the police chiefs, uh, you know, some departments that I'm still talking to that, that never quite came on board, uh, their biggest um, concern was how this data would be used against them, right? And, and whether or not, uh, you know, they knew as soon as they put the data out there, they knew what the headlines would be. 
Mm -hmm. And we've seen it as, as more and more data sets have come out uh, around officer involved shootings, even at the local level. I could, I could, if a police department puts out a data around officer involved shootings, I can tell you what the headline will be in the paper next, the next day. More black men are killed than any other race in the city, right? And so we, we've got that out the way. <laughs> I think we're all pretty set on that. What we haven't seen is some more nuanced analysis and greater dialogue around this. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in part, we, we need to start to hold into account uh, journalism as well. And so. Yeah to have to, to push them to move past just the sensational headline and to say, let's be, you know, this is your community as well. Let's be, let's be uh, you know, fair partners here. Um, and, you know, the police chiefs, you know, whether, however you feel about them or not, in, in many ways they're, they're sticking their neck out on the line politically uh, once they push for this. And some, some are built tougher than others and they're, they're fine taking those knots. But I think, and, I, and I've seen it happen in the D.C. area, it has this chilling effect where departments kind of clam up and don't want to be as transparent. And so I think that's one of the, uh, the places that we need to move beyond is just having you know, context, fair analysis, um, and dialogue around this and not just always going for, for the sensationalism. Um, so, and, th and this one, I think, again, leadership is really critical. Um, we have a very vocal mayor around the use of data and technology, so it makes it easier when we want to work with our departments because the question, we still have to struggle with the question of, well, how is this data going to be used against me? But I think there's a little bit of a non-starter in that we know that it, we're going to be releasing information. Um, so I, I think leadership is critical around the political side of it. But I think that one of the things that the that isn't really talked a lot about is that even in larger cities like Los Angeles, there isn't a lot of investment quite yet in data and technology. And so as the, so this is a more, you know, technological challenge, which is that um, as, you know, technology, you know, technology has really exploded and data has become just more pervasive, cities and governments aren't really able to play in that space because budgets just don't allow it. Um, so there is a challenge there. We've been working for over a year with our police department. Um, we were one of the first um, signatories to the police data initiative, and we will be releasing, and we probably have one of the more comprehensive sets of arrests, calls for service, crimes, um, and now we'll have actual stops. Um, and we will have that for um, back to, to go back to 2010. So that's a large amount of police data that's out there. But the amount of time and resources it takes and the lack of resources even within the department to be able to do that just makes that a very slow and steady process. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then the other thing too is, um, I, 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 I wanna just echo the journalism point. I do think that that is a challenge for us because as we're trying to show um, in the city um, personnel uh, the value of data, right? Like this open data, even the police related data, right? It's useful for them as well to understand and to begin to use a lot of new tools to go beyond predictive policing and into more nuanced analytics about where they could be um, creating new programs or developing um, partnerships. That could be really useful in our own efforts to um, reduce crime in the city. Uh, but as we're trying to make that, that argument, it's really hard when the narrative always becomes about you know, the focus on increasing crime or, or the police citizen interaction. And so I, I, I do think that, there is, that it's a challenge there for those that are trying to work within city government to push data because you will be, um, you will be dinged. You know that that's gonna happen when the data is released. So it, it's a little bit of a tension, but we still kind of work through it. And um, I think you're seeing a lot of cities across America actually make this data much more available and, and it's a great example to so I think intermediaries can really help accelerate the field if they do a couple of things. So when we were doing the Promise Neighborhoods work, we said as an intermediary, we should only exist if we can do three things. Accelerate local leaders' ability to get results faster than they could on their own, build evidence for the work, and help to scale and sustain it. So what that meant from us right off the bat was that we actually had to buy the data infrastructure for the movement. So six <coughs> sites across the country, we bought the data infrastructure, $400,000 a year, saved our network more than $2 million a year, actually got folks up on data system and platforms in six months instead of taking two or three years to build it their own, them, on their own. We bought efforts to outcomes and the data dashboard from Clear Impact, paid for them to, those two to talk. Because imagine trying to do all the data work and you can't actually see your data. And so it wasn't just a matter of us doing it because we wanted to have nice data infrastructure. It was fundamental to do the work. But it was also fundamental because we knew something else was going to happen. It gets to the politics. Leaders have to hold all the complexity. So imagine an intermediary 
getting this gift for the field of having all this money from promised neighborhoods, which is exactly what the field has asked for. You get it in a hostile political environment, and you're going to blow it, one, because you have bad practice, no discipline away from to move from talk to action. And then you have no way of telling a result story. We already knew that stuff from the beginning. <laughs> Two years in, Senator Klein issued an audit of Promise Neighborhoods from the Government Accountability Office. They don't care about good practice. They look for waste, fraud, and abuse. What they found when they looked at 40 Promise Neighborhood sites is this disciplined approach that I'm talking to. If you pull up GAO and Promise Neighborhoods, you'll see the report. The report was so good, they chose not to even issue it. <laughs> what, what they saw, all they could say is, we need to do a national evaluation for which Congress hadn't even authorized any money for. So what I'm telling you is, if leaders are actually able to hold all the complexity, build the right infrastructure, you can actually sell, accelerate to getting to impact. If many of you all who have done large scale community change efforts know, it usually takes us two years to just start talking to each other. So to look at, two, look at over 40 sites in two years and not to be able to come back with a major audit finding is really a testament to what the field has built in terms of capacity across the country. Pay for the infrastructure, help our funders understand what it costs, and choose not to do the work if you can't get the right stuff to do it. Well, our, we have a room full of civic leaders um, in, across multiple sectors. And with this all-star panel, I, I'm sure you have some questions. Now, in this context, I'm going to try to moderate fewer comments and, and more questions uh, to this panel because of the knowledge that's represented here is terrific. So who would like to ask the first question to the panel? Just raise your hand. See a few hands this side, this side. Hi, thank you. This is very interesting. I was wondering, you know, have you traveled to other countries or seen anything like in comparable cities where they use data in a very efficient, um, successful way? Yes, I get to. Um, so as part of just the growing movement of open data, we get to network a lot more um, with other cities, both large and small, and across the, and across the world, actually, around open data and, and data in general. Um, and I actually, so I'm, I'm heartened to know that Los Angeles is actually you know, right there, and I can connect with some of the best cities in the world around our use of data, and really our publishing of data as well. Um, we, we have one of the more robust um, open data programs. Um, and you know, the extent of which um, the information we have out there is only as, but it's only as good as people are using it. And so I think one of the areas where we are also seeing where I think LA stands out is that we're really trying to create more of the context. We're not just releasing information, but we really are using that information both internally with our city departments um, to build capacity and then externally trying to work with other groups to be able to use that data meaningfully. So, um, so I, you know, I'm heartened to say that LA is, is doing really well. I do think that we, um, I'll just go back to the investment piece, I do think that you know, Europe has greater investment in data and technology infrastructure, and then Asia and the Middle East are really um, pouring billions of dollars into this. And so the one, um, you know, kind of tangential note that I'll make is that as we, you know, as we continue to propel forward into this tech world that we live in, um, you know, are our youth going to be able to really participate in that? And I think the digital divide and that conversation is just as inter you know, it's just as important to this. Um, government transparency is one piece, but the digital divide um, is a critical aspect of that. Um, people, you know, the average citizen's ability to understand data and be data literate and understand privacy and understand the use of their data is going to be critical. And the other issue that we don't really get to talk about because it feels very technical and foreign is this issue of net neutrality, which is something that is going to be more and more important. Our lives, I, I, I tend to um, think about, are more and more digital than they really are um, real here in this, in this physical space. And the more that the internet becomes tiered and restricted, um, the more that our own ability as a citizenry to be able to speak our voice and even use the data the government is is releasing to to act is going to be um, hampered. So those are issues where I do think other parts of the world are much further ahead in thinking about and talking about. 
than we are here. Um, but I think on the use of data and government transparency in data, I actually think um, the US is quite open. Um, you know, I don't know if you would. Okay. Agree. All right. I think there's a question next over here. Hi, I have a quick comment, I apologize, and then a question. Um, I want to just thank you for bringing up this notion of data not being inherently good or even neutral without regard to how it might have been the methods of collection or analysis, because I think that's a really important point. Um, my question is around, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Steve Ballmer's new project, USA Facts. Uh, it's around um, creating a comprehensive database for government spending and revenue. Is there a, a greater role that either nonprofits, um, business, social entrepreneurs can play in data collection and analysis, or does that bring its own set of problems? I, I'll jump in and say yes, really quickly. I actually, I will just make a plug for the nonprofit space is the one area where we don't have a whole lot of data um, collection. And I think as we need to create greater capacity so that our nonprofit sector can also get into this, um, into this space. Um, and then the private sector, um, private sector data sharing is actually very, very limited. And I think that's a, that's a challenge for solving social issues. It's also a challenge around transparency and accountability, because just as much as we want government to be transparent and accountable, we need to make sure that the private sector is, is, is likewise, so. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, if you go back even to the beginning of the Obama administration, I mean, this was one of, it's kind of open data, um, open government, transparency, and uh, was one of his top priorities, uh, trying to liberate data from the federal level um, and, and with that, the, the whole notion being this is taxpayer-funded, citizen-generated data, we need to be returning that back to the citizens for the precise purposes of hopefully nonprofits, private sector entities building new companies, building on top of that data. I mean, we've seen, you know, the weather industry is probably the biggest one, and, you know, weather.com, uh, uh, weather underground, all those, uh, where that's this whole industry fueled on government collected data, right? And so his bet was how do we how do we seed these other fields and areas through these different types of data sets? I think, you know, the, the, the data kind of, you know, is the quote unquote easy piece, right? It's then how do you create value on top of that? And I think um, that's not necessarily uh, a place where uh, I think government should be doing some of that, but it's, it's very limited capacity to do that. Um, and I think that we need um, both a, a robust private sector in, in in nonprofit sector uh, building on top of these data sets. So two things that I would add, I would say the first is to actually think about how do you join the folks who are doing work so that you're actually starting by collecting data that is actually needed to actually move the work forward. This whole notion of government and private sector collecting more data, I totally agree with. And the, the second thing I would ask you to think about is what are the skill sets needed for the sector to move forward to do the work at scale right now? Capacity around data is one problem. But there's another problem around actually knowing how to make sense of it and actually how to lead on it is a problem. If you look at all of our universities, we're not actually producing folks who actually know how to lead with discipline. They don't know Six Sigma. They don't know results-based accountability. They know theory. And so you can give them all the data they want, but they've nowhere in their coursework with all the student loan debt that they're going to have. Do they actually learn with discipline how to move folks from talk to action and weave in discipline, we weave in equity, weave in all the complexity that we're talking about? So what I would hope that we start doing is not decoupling these conversations around capacity and infrastructure separately, but uh, forcing people to deal with it all. Absolutely, we need data. It's a piece of infrastructure critical for the sector. But it's also critical that you come up with these other competencies. We have a, an army of folks act out here who actually know how to use that data, make sense of it, and then inspire folks to take action. Hi, my name's Deanna. I work with the Center for Urban Education at USC. And one of my favorite ways to use data is to have a disruptive moment um, where it actually um, you know, puts people in a place of cognitive dissonance um, and interrupts bias. And I'm wondering if any of you could speak to an experience you've had where you had the thrill of data that kind of threw everybody uh, because it, it threw them into cognitive dissonance. I'm, uh, I'm a little stumped on that one, I will say. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, what I will say is that, so, and this isn't kind of a, this is not uh, a feel-good area, but it's, um, 
one of the things that came out of the police data initiative work was um, a lot of conversation around, um, you know, how do you represent or should you represent uh, data about uh, domestic violence and sexual assault in some of these public data sets, right? And I don't know that we ever came to a really good answer on that. And in part, uh, so we, we helped do uh, lead kind of a data dive in Orlando, Florida. Police chief came out, their, uh, their chief data officer, chief information officer, as well as they invited, invited in the nonprofit sector, so I think National Network uh, to End Domestic Violence, and a few others. And um, the dissonance that, that came about there um, in, was you had a group, so in NDV, for instance, who on the one hand wanted to see, you know, you could say, all right, let's just strip all this data out of the, out of the data set, right? That, that might be one answer. But then, if you look at it as a member of the public, you might say, well, domestic violence and sexual assault just doesn't happen in our area, right? And we know that's not true, right? And so, on the other side, so then with the, the tension between how do you represent this in the data so that we're, that we're true to this story, but at the same time, protecting the privacy uh, of the women that were, that were victims and making it not such that, you know, whether it's a, um, you know, someone who's trying to find them, right, can go back and see the end of the data, or just nosy neighbors, right, um, and who may or may not know anyway. And so it's, it was, it was interesting to see and hear about how this nonprofit who, you know, was having to grapple with this tension and I guess dissonance, if you will, around what to do about this representation uh, in the data set. Um, I think it's a, I don't know that we've come to a, a very satisfactory place on that, but it's just one, at least for me, when you, when you raise that was one piece of this that I think uh, folks have been grappling with. Uh, just quickly, I, I would say um, this is a good moment to call out. So do you all recall Kobe Bryant's last game and what the LA Times, one of the things the LA Times did with hmm. the last game commemoration? Um, they mapped every single shot that Kobe took throughout his entire career. That, does anybody remember this? It's one of the best actual data visualizations, I think, that I've ever seen, and I always remember it. And I loved hearing um, the young man from the data team at the LA Times talk about what it took to do that. And the reason why I'll just mention, so that one was like really like exciting for me, um, to your point. But the reason why, the value and, and the inspiration I take from that is that if we all can um, just remember that every single interaction we all have, this can be kind of scary, has actually a latitude, longitude, latitude, longitude and a place and time and, and location to it all. If we can keep that in mind, we can do like really, really powerful things um, that can both be entertaining as well as really um, impactful on the social change side. So um, when we talk about not having access to data, I just think, um, remember, you know, just if we can map every single shot that Kobe Bryant took by looking at all that footage, I'm pretty sure through all of our throes of information or, or interactions that we have at the community, at the, at the government, and at the private sector level, we can definitely map out um, you know, solutions to our, to our problems, um, to, to, to many of our large problems. So I take inspiration from that one. Now, I know <laughs> that, that I'm actually the moderator, but my favorite kind of cognitive <coughs> dissonance, yeah. if you don't mind, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> has to do with research uh, around immigrants and you can fill in the blank. Um, yeah. First of all, it's immigrants and mobility, right? There's the perception that immigrants kind of come and go. They, they're always looking for the jobs, so that could be both positive and negative and so forth. What did the data show? Data show that once immigrants move in for the first time from outside the country to a community, they're more likely to stay there than those who are not immigrants. So they are community members from the get-go, right? So people don't know that, cognitive dissonance. You can talk about immigrants and High-tech entrepreneurship. You could talk about immigrants and housing. You could talk about Im immigrants and education. You saw Bill Vega. I don't know if you saw the little plus. It was small. Immigrants and health. Where did they score on that health chart? Much healthier, right? I've just been. It doesn't. This this is part of the conversation even this morning about evidence and some of the dissonance people have with their belief structures and so forth. But it's always just mind-boggling to me the way that. You know, people are, you know, have these fears of, I mean, I forgot to mention immigrants and less crime in the neighborhood, right? These are just the facts that exist and so forth around us. And so people tend to, even though we should know this, because these have been facts that are out there, every time I show up another chart with immigrants and this outcome, people continue to go, oh, really? <laughs> but that, that's my favorite kind of piece of dissonance. I don't know if, Michael, you had another answer to that or we move on. One example would be an organization that was really good at what it does. Um, 
one of the indicators in promised neighborhoods is that families are talking about the, to their children about going to college. They went out and did a community survey. 90% of the surveys came back saying that families were talking to their kids about going to college. And this is an example of bad practice because you should have always triangulated that information anyway and they weren't doing good data practice. It was a frontline worker who works in the community who was looking at that data and was saying, wow, this is not right. Something's wrong with the data. So they decided to go out and triangulate it, which they should have done. They discovered that 90% of the families were talking to their kids about college, but they were telling them not to go. So imagine, this is a perfect example of what I mean by bad practice. Imagine if you had to just jump to your muscle. I'm going to double down on community outreach because I've been in the community for 20 years. I know what it is. We need to do more community outreach. That's what they were going to do. But it was a frontline worker who kept pushing them. They would say, that's not right. Something's wrong with the data. P families were telling their kids not to go because they were undocumented, <laughs> because they wanted them not to leave home, et cetera. So there was a lot more complexity. So this is a good example of what happens if you look at data, don't bring good practice, <laughs> and don't actually use it to craft really good strategy. They would have been trying to step back from that huge embarrassment three years later when it could have been simply avoided in the first place by good practice. Thank you. So I, wa I wanted, to, I, I wanted to, to jump on this point about um, the nonprofit sector and data. Having worked across multiple sectors, um, I think it's really important as a cautionary tale to not ask people to do the thing that they're not, that, that they're not necessarily uh, aligned to be doing. You could take the example of the Cultural Data Project, which was held up by philanthropy as an amazing process to get data from cultural nonprofits. And then if you talk to the nonprofits, they weren't trained, and then when they were trained, they had to hire full-time staff just to accommodate the data demands, mm -hmm. taking them away from the actual culture work that they were doing. Local governments are being asked to produce data, but the feds, when they give the grants, are not be providing enough funding to, 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 to provide the data. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment about how we build systems that don't ask people to do the things that they're not necessarily supposed to be doing, but instead to think collaborative, collaboratively and build systems of collaboration, right? So that, so that we know we have to get the data um, again, just one other example, in social entrepreneurship, there have been a number of articles about demanding data from social entrepreneurs, which takes them away from actually doing the social entrepreneurship. So how do we divvy up the jobs in ways that uh, provide the results that we want, encourage people to think across functions so they're not siloing each other, but also don't put unrealistic demands on highly strained infrastructure, whether it's nonprofit or local government or other sectors? Well, Michael, I know you already gave an example of when the Promised Neighborhoods, some of the investments that you made to make sure that capacity was there, but are there other examples the panel might mention or thoughts about how to overcome this issue? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, I made the comment about the nonprofits, and I think um, what I, and I think I mentioned, we need to invest in our capacity, and it's not just the nonprofit sector. We need to, I mean, in government, we need to invest in our capacity to use data. We, um, you know, this year we've held several forums internally. One is about how do you manage with data, teaching. I think your point about the leadership. How do you, as a leader, manage the staff that have these data skills, but maybe you don't know how to ask the right questions, or you don't know what exactly to measure. And then at the same time, we're teaching staff how do you take advantage of all these new tools that make it easy for you to map just about every single thing at a granular level and actually ask the right questions or find the non-obvious insight. So, I mean, I think there's a capacity issue and I think capacity investing in it. So to your point, I think it's critical that there be more of an integration of funding um, when you are doing program development and program implementation that includes funding for data and technology, right? So that we're not leaving nonprofits to to do you know, work in the 21st century without the 21st century tools that they need to actually interact with many of the people 
who are very connected, very mobile. Um, so I think we need to do the funding. But the other thing that I would say is this is where I think our academic institutions are so critical. Um, we have great partnerships with both UCLA and USC, but primarily actually we've done some amazing work with USC, both on the spatial sciences side as well as um, you know, in supporting Gary's work around neighborhood um, index. And you know, we want to continue to, to provide our support and our data um, in his efforts. So really looking as to how we can use the infrastructure that universities have and that have built and that capacity to, to do our own work, I think, is something that from the city side we see as really critical. And I think that um, the nonprofit sector could, you know, it, it's a natural partnership that could be um, more and more developed and, and I think is being leveraged um, every day, so. Yeah, I mean, I, just, just quickly, I just echo, I, I think funded partnerships, um, I think meeting people where they're at, taking a user-centered approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of the things that we did, we didn't really get into it in the police data initiative, we asked departments to commit to releasing at least three open data sets around police citizen interactions. They could choose the data sets. Um, they wanted to go through a process mm -hmm. with the community to figure out what those data sets are that were important to that community. And the other piece that we didn't do, we didn't actually have requirements around if you were going to do a use of force data set, we didn't say your use of force data set has to look like this. And you know, we, we took some knocks for that, and, uh, and, uh, but I will defend it as we wanted to start folks moving forward with what they could do with what the resources that they had at that point in time. And so we didn't want to put up a bunch of barriers to say, well, if you're not going to release your data and it looks, needs to look exactly like this, then we don't want to see it at all. Um, and so we, we, I know for a fact we got a lot more participation in, in part because we let folks start this process of moving forward. And so what we were able to do from that is now we can kind of see what some of these common emergent standards are once we let 10 departments release uh, you know, use of force data, we can start to see what that looks like. And it looks a little bit different in each place, but you have kind of these core things that emerge from there. Um, and I want to say, when I say user-centered approach, um, you know, one of the things, I, I keep going back to the police example, the reason a lot of this data isn't good is because the, the, the systems and the ways that officers are being asked to collect this data alongside their duties, to your point, of, of actually policing, um, does not allow them to, the time, the space, to actually input that data in a way that would actually be meaningful to anyone trying to do some analysis later on. And that was uh, that convening we did April uh, 2015. That was the biggest, one of the biggest complaints we heard from the chiefs in that room is that they felt they were being dictated to by the vendors to say, you're, here's our system, you're gonna use it, and your officers gotta figure out a way. Um, and so I've actually seen now some, some, some other companies who are now taking more of this user-centered approach that have done thousands of ride-alongs with officers and now have a system where I talked to the chief of Canada, New Jersey, who just like fell in love with this new product, but they had developed it over time with their officers. And so how can you think, think about systems and ways of data collection that are along the lines, I think technology will make it easier, but don't, yeah. to your point, don't impede with people's kind of primary jobs, right? Maybe we have time for one more question. Yes, I have a, I guess a little statement before I make the question. Uh, I've been studying riots for the last, I guess, decade. Uh, and probably the most interesting riot is Mexico City, 1692. It was about 300 years before our riot or rebellion. And I think Sometimes we just need a lot of distance. I, hopefully we don't need 300 right. years. But the, the initial uh, reaction to the 1692 riot was that it was a food riot. It was much more than a food riot. Uh, just like what we talk about, right away when it happened, everybody was you know, making statements about what it was. But I think it was more than just a police you know, riot, actually. You know what I'm saying? Because I think the police pretty much took an active approach to put down the rebellion. But I guess I just want to ask the question, you know, to you guys, you know, how many, how much more time will we need for people to kind of settle in and be able to tell the truth about what happened in 1992? Uh, question. So if, if you have a comment, I mean, you know, I, I, the panelists, you know, may not have that particular. It's hard to know, know. the answer to that in yeah. precise terms, but. There has been a data revolution, there's been an information revolution, but as some of the, the commenters earlier today mentioned, you know, sometimes that time actually narrows down our perspective in an unhelpful way. 
So I think it's incumbent on a, an event like this that commemorates it, that we can tell the full set of stories that have happened, why, where we've come, where we see ourselves going. 